15 minutes in a room event. I'm grateful for Mark Gunderson, architect in Fort Worth, for establishing and renewing the contact with Torquay and the College of Architecture. Um, notable works of Torquay, the list is too long to list, but I give you a personal favorite or some personal favorites. The Cistercian Chapel and Library, my personal favorite. Prince and Peace Catholic Church and School, Addison Theater Center, the Pump House Art and Conference Center. And I like that particularly because it's an adaptive reuse project, a conversion from a 90s, 20 Turtle Creek Pump Station. Also, sort of book and his many awards, um, sort of special, I find, besides receiving Nomer and Design Award over 60, as I said, Corky was inducted in the Fellow of American Architects FIAA in the 1990s. In 2019, Corky was awarded the O'Neill Ford Medal for Design Achievement. By coincidence or not, this lecture hall, that building, is actually designed by O'Neill Ford. I'm thanking the College of Architecture Lecture Committee, Dr. Jeffrey S. Nesbitt, Chair, Professor Zara Safraverdi, Professor Noemi Deplan Lichtert, and Professor Christy Meyer. Uh, staff member and committee member Rachel Rowe for their service to the College of Architecture, and Lindsay Mims, our Director of Communication, together with Oscar Nabdividat for the communication through posters. Our building director, Jeff Huber, and finally, but last but not least, um, Tim Bender, IT specialist, to make sure we will hear today. So without further ado, please help me to welcome Gary Corey Cunningham to the College of Architecture with his lecture, Reconnecting. Good afternoon. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, Upe, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I'm so sorry I'm not there today. I, we had planned on flying down this morning, but Southwest planned it differently. I think there's a, a serious shortage of pilots and ground crew. So we're doing this via Zoom. Um, which I certainly miss interacting with the students and feeling the room of the first high rise building in, in Lubbock, Texas, the, the great O'Neill Ford building that y'all are sitting in now. Um, so can everybody hear, hear me okay? Can I get a nod? Okay. Um, so this has been a very interesting 18 or 19 months for everyone. And what I want to do today is kind of talk a little bit initially about my experience over the last 19 or 20 months and how it's influenced my thinking about our work and how it's also caused me to go back and rethink or just look at some of the projects we've done over the last 10 or 15 years and how them, they might be relevant to some of the challenges we as architects and uh, it, you know students of architecture are going to be facing over the next you know generations. Um, so I'm going to try to share my screen now. So that I can't share. Okay, that's, that did it, I think. OK, 
Okay, are we on? Okay, so um, 2018, 20 months ago, February of 2020, I was actually traveling and I was traveling back to America from a rather from the most distant island on the planet, Easter Island or Rapa Nui, as many people call it. So it's, you know, leaving a place of kind of uh, isolation and quiet coming back to America with a mask on was was quite a change for me. Um, the uh, of course, the idea of travel, I think, is so important, and, and I'm going to make little plugs here of, of, of kind of different uh, behaviors or different recommendations on your life, and, and traveling is such a wonderful way to get a sense of the planet, um, you know, our environments, and you don't have to go, you don't have to get on a jet and go to Chile to do that. You can also drive, you know, 100 miles from Lubbock, uh, looking at farmlands, go to, go to Marfa, go to Terralingua, go to El Paso. Uh, go everywhere you go or anywhere you can and, and learn about scale, uh, different cultures. It absolutely affects the way you look at your own place in your own life. So, uh, and again, it doesn't have to be anywhere special. And in fact, we're neighbors to one of the most unique, I think, countries in the, in the world, and that is Mexico. And if I could pick anywhere to go and visit and spend time, it would be Mexico itself. So you don't have to go to, to Easter Island or to Europe, go to Mexico or go anywhere and just kind of get a feel for uh, what's happening in the world. Uh, this, of course, are some of the, uh, some of the statues in, 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 uh, in Easter Island that, that I was visiting and looking at. Um, also came back to meet my first grandson, uh, Colin Cunningham. This is my third child or my second son, Miles, and got to visit Miles and Colin on the 15th of February of 2020, and then basically didn't, didn't see each other for quite some time due to the, uh, to the to COVID and the isolation we were all experiencing. You know, and for me, family life is, has such a relevance and, and an important reference to me in my work, uh, just to, again, reflect back on uh, family, loved ones, whatever. Uh, it, it, should, it, should have an, it should have a say in your work as well. Do not be an architect that, that lives in isolation, but bring in your rest of your life to your work. Um, speaking of work, I, I live and work in Dallas, Texas, and I am in a little building uh, sandwiched between downtown Dallas, this yellow zone, and the river, Trinity River, in a kind of an area called the Design District. And uh, I'm in a a uh, 20,000 square foot building, a little office building here. I live back here in the back under this big live oak tree. And in this building, you know, we've got maybe 30 people that office with us, uh, engineers, other architects, rendering people. It's a really wonderful environment. But you know, when COVID hit last year, the thing, the place went dead quiet. In fact, I could sit outside in the front yard and not see a car pass in front of my building all day, which was, which was kind, of, kind of shocking. But, it, you know, being in this isolated kind of period of time, of course, I, I was you know, watching the mail and receiving packages and making a hand sanitizer and tracking down masks and all that kind of stuff. But there was a lot of time to kind of sit and reflect. And I spent a lot of that time sitting on the front porch of my house, a little loft, looking out at the parking lot and the industrial environment beyond. And of course, once COVID hit, it was pretty much empty all the time. So, uh, and it was also strangely quiet. And in fact, you know, I, I thought that there was an increase of nature or bird life because it, it became so loud, the birds singing and chirping. But I later realized that um, all these highways that surround me here had basically pretty much shut down. There were no cars in the roads. And so the, the sound floor uh, became so quiet that nature literally just started ramping up uh, the sound and that's all I heard and it was kind of a uh, I felt like that the, uh, the planet was going back to nature and that the car had kind of you know temporarily been shut down and we were you know feeling the air getting cleaner uh, you know the birds getting louder it, it was just a 
uh, for me, it was a kind of a really wonderful experience to, to have this isolation and quiet and time to reflect. Uh, because there's a lot to reflect on, lot to reflect on, and it's kind of amazing how much time I sat in the front yard, out of the air conditioning, or whatever, and and just being close to these trees and these the sounds and nature, and of course realized that I yearned for that, and and I probably yearned more for the nature, and and the and the kind of the the light uh, and the openness than I did for people. Uh, of course, I'm kind of a loner many, much of the time anyway, but you know there's a lot of thoughts that went to my head during this period of time. And, and I want to talk about three specific projects that, um, that kind of help reinforce some of these concepts that I feel are very valid in, in our thinking right now. And in the course, they're valid all the time, but these, maybe these issues or these buildings or what we did in these buildings resonate more with me during this, this sort of time uh, when we are in such a challenging environment. Um, and of course, you know, sitting on the front porch, you know, go, looking at the different sunsets and the light, and of course, experiencing uh, February freeze getting here when everything was shut. We were shut down for a week without any power at all, and it was kind of nice because we got quiet again, and I enjoyed the solitude. Um, and of course, we're now, you know, back to life and busy working, and the building is rather full, and uh, life is kind of much of it's gone back to normal, with the exception of flying to Lubbock, Texas. And, and maybe dealing with uh, the technology. Uh, so this first project is a little nature center in Cedar Hill, Texas, about 30 minutes from Dallas to the south. And it is set in about 2000 acres of a pretty much wildlife preserve and a large lake. And um, our client was Audubon, Texas. And they, they had a very clear mission. Uh, and, and in fact, we work with, with the landscape uh, firm named Mesa that, um, I'm trying to get rid of this screen, that helped kind of analyze the, the site. And, you know, it's, it's basically almost 300 acres of four very distinct habitat, syst habitat systems and quite a few uh, endangered species, both in terms of plants and birds. And in fact, we realized that this land had really not been touched or walked on since Native Americans, uh, you know, several hundred years ago. So it was pretty much intact. And, you know, we, we came across, uh, you know, all these different systems. And also, you know, uh, here, here we have a picture of a, of a black, uh, uh, sort of vario black banded, uh, black cat, a vario bird, sorry. And it's nest, which is actually made of the bark, the uh, strips of bark from the juniper tree, which uh, you see a juniper tree there. And these birds need to have these trees uh, in order to nest and in order to uh, produce ch children. They also need to have uh, no really other trees in the environment besides these, these juniper trees, only because they need the amount of, a certain amount of light. And of course, spending time on the site and learning about that was quite wonderful. And, and the site we had ourselves had its own interesting challenges going on. It was a brownfield. Uh, it was an existing satellite dish installation for AT&T and had this massive dish in it. And we had to go about basically uh, cleaning this thing up. And th the idea was to put the building on this already disturbed brownfield and not impact the three, 400 acres of kind of rather sacred uh, environment. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we proceeded to design a building. And of course, like a lot of projects, it was a very challenging budget. Um, so, you know, you're looking here at, and, and Dogwood Canyon is this kind of this big zone to the south of the site, which is right here in this, this little, uh, this little pinned in piece. And here is an aerial of the site. Uh, you can see the, uh, the highway, which is, uh, I think, 1632 or something uh, that rings uh, Cedar Hill in Dallas. And looking back, you can see the, the three, 400 acres of, of preserve and, and, in and beyond you see Joe Pool Lake and all this acreage around you with basically just full of wildlife. And you see the parking we put in and you see, you see the building. The building um, is plopped on the site and it is literally wedged in between uh, the, uh, this, this little dish hole, which was placed there to put the dish in and the, the dense forest and a creek beyond. So it's a really very tight fit. 
And the idea is that people bring their cars in and they park and they walk and go on this building and then take off into uh, the, the nature preserve. So you can see where the dish was located at one time. And here's a view into this bowl right here. And then there's the building itself. And you can see the people walking up to the building and you see the, uh, the, the trees beyond. And you also, also notice that the building has a very bright white roof. And y'all should know this, uh, but you know, this is uh, a white roof to reflect heat. And because the roof is gently sloped away from the view to the uh, north, nobody can tell it's a white roof unless you're on the air. And of course the birds that fly around. But this building is a, is a gold lead building. And uh, so, you know, we are also trying to teach the idea of conservation and respect um, and sustainability, which is so critical. So here, here's a shot of the dish, you know, when it was in this bowl. And again, maneuvering through this place, uh, when we first got there, it was full of poison ivy. Uh, and unfortunately, we, we, hoped, we thought we could keep the dish and reuse it, but the uh, owner of the land took the dish with, with them. I guess it had some value. But uh, that's fine. Um, now, what's interesting about the siding of this building is, you know, you've got the circle here, which is the, this dish where the uh, where the where the satellite dish sat. And here, you, to the south of the building, you have this creek, which floods quite a bit. And here's a building sandwiched in between. Well, we we could not do a traditional foundation where you plant the building into the dirt because water needs to flow under the building to get to the to get to the creek because uh, the area to the, to the north of, of, of the building is, is higher than the building. So it's gonna flow south under the building into the creek. If we had put the building on a foundation, we would have been stopping the water and probably trying to do a, uh, a swale around it and killing half the trees in it. Because when you, once you start moving dirt and affecting root systems around trees, those trees are not gonna survive. So when you, when you work around trees, you've got to really leave the earth and leave the ground very much intact. And, you know, so in section, this little building here, you can see it and you see the, the creek here and to the left here, this is the north entrance. Water needs to be able to flow underneath the building to get to, this, to the creek uh, because it does flood. Uh, this, this is after a good healthy rain and that bowl is completely filled up. And in fact, we studied making this a permanent water feature, but our client, Annie Brown, who's the director of Autobahn, Texas, um, said, how do, you, how do you intend to keep water in this, into this, uh, in this feature? Well, we said we'd you know, maybe put a, a well in a windmill or something like that and pump water into it. And she goes, well, Audubon has an attitude is we, don't, we don't, do not like drilling holes into the earth. So, uh, because you know, it's not a cool thing to do. And the amount of evaporation you have when you have an open water, like open area of water like this is devastating. It, it, it'll, it'll evaporate in a matter of days. So if we were pumping water out, using utilizing resources, uh, taking groundwater out of the earth, we would have been really doing a disservice to, to the land and to the site. So we, we, we were very much instructed to use it as a teaching tool and, and not kind of go with our in, in, instinct or intuition to make it a beautiful water feature, but to let it be what it is and teach that to the people that do visit this place. Um, now, the way we, we kept this, uh, we kept the water flowing under these buildings is literally lift, right, lift the building up off the ground and, and, and prop it up. And we put, drilled some piers in there and used simply simple steel bar joists and jacked the building up. So this, this is very much the expression of how the building operates with the land. Uh, we respect the land, we're light on the land. We did not engage it with the exception of these 18 inch round pier holes. And the, the ground plane that was there is still, we walked in is still there today which is such a critical thing. And you know, a very subtle thing, but believe me, when you kind of drill down into this attitude and understand and respect that level of, of, kind, of, of, of kind of relationship between trees and the, and the land, you'll, you'll understand because you, there's a tree five feet from the building over to the right here that you know, had we had to drain around this building, we would have taken those trees out and we'd have lost all the in, impact of this building sitting in the trees. Um, Looking at the, at the building itself, it's a very simple wood frame structure, again, to, to, uh, to make it uh, sustainable and to, and to get, get leads. And the, the siding is actually a, an acetified wood, which we use a lot of. In fact, the last, last project you'll see today has a good bit of this. And it's in the name of this wood is called a Koya. And it's spelled A-C-C-O-Y-A. -C -C and it's worth looking up because this wood does not really require paint or stain. Uh, it will not rot. 
uh, now in this case, we stained it with the water-based ink because we wanted it to go black and green and have it fade into the trees. We really didn't want this, did not want this building to be obvious or visible. Uh, again, the building is not the, the point on this project. The building is really a funnel to route people into the nature preserve. And so, you know, I'm not, I'm not the big dog here. We, we are very secondary to the purpose of this project. And there's times you've got to realize that and accept that and be comfortable with being the quiet side of the equation and not being the loud, you know, big star architects we all want to be. Um, so you, there you look at the, the front elevation with the building picked up off the ground. And of course, a very gentle accessible ramp going up to the building itself and this low, low long building. Um, and it's got a beautiful flow. And as the grasses grow, it, it does more to downplay the building and just keep it as quiet as it can in, in the nature uh, of the site. And so this, this little pedestrian bridge or ramp, you know, spans over this, this space down here, this, this dish hole. Uh, and you can see to the left here, these little stacked concrete blocks. Those are actually cut up original paving on the site that we cut up and utilized for uh, retaining walls and wheel stops. The idea was not to haul anything off the site, but to reuse every piece we could find. Now I'll tell you, cutting up this concrete and reusing it costs a lot more than going out and buying some flagstone and stacking it up. But you know, we, we felt it was right to spend the money and really somewhat burden the budget to show that we were trying to reutilize this material um, and, and again, do a complete kind of attitude on this approach to respect there and not haul any garbage off. And of course, there's a there's signage here explaining what's going on here and the, the history of the dish. You can see a picture of it there. Again, you can see the building hovering above you here. And this is the ramp going down the other side. So the plan of the building is very simple. There's two, there's two boxes. Uh, this one has a large meeting area, bathrooms, offices, a little gift shop, place to get your water bottle, bottle filled, and two classrooms. The important thing is this, these roof areas that cantilever past the buildings and this port that's formed in between the two buildings that really form a portal from the gathering area in front of the building to the north to the actual path uh, to, to the dogwood, to the canyon itself. So you can see the people gathering here, you see this hole between the two buildings and green back there. And there you're looking at this pure nature and, and, and the, the path to the, uh, to, to the path to the trail. So, you know, going through this, you see, you know, the, the glass door to go in and get your water bottle filled, use the bathroom. But again, the idea is not to stop, not to go to the gift shop, not to buy postcards, but go and get into the trail and, and, and see what's going on out there. Now on this side of the building, you know, we're, we're very much native and you probably see some poison ivy right there. And you also notice this, uh, this, this room here, which is with this slanted glass. And you may question why this glass is slanted. It's slanted to try to keep the birds from flying into the glass and killing themselves. Uh, you know, when you put a window in a forest, uh, it, it makes basically makes a mirror. So when a bird takes off and start and, and sees that glass, they may they may see a reflection of a sky. And so they think they're flying into the sky and they'll slam into that glass and wipe out. That is not a, a very kind of positive, you know, signal in a nature center to have bird, dead birds sitting around the building. And you'll see uh, later in the last project that we have, you know, there's a new way to do bird safe glass and we're figuring this stuff out and so are the people that, that make glass and it's, it's becoming, you know, an easier uh, way to protect wildlife because we lose a lot of birds to glass and it's often downplayed, but something that again, every little bit really matters. And every, any building you do, there's a lot of kind of parameters, a lot of issues you really need to drill down and consider. And sometimes it takes, you, you veer off for a long time to research and understand what the right solution is. And you've got to back check it, test it, and see if you can even afford it, which usually you can't. Um, in fact, I'm standing in the creek here, looking back up at the uh, bird viewing area. And you know, I've seen this creek with water you know, up, up to here. So uh, it's very much a seasonal uh, creek. And again, it often floods and the building is sitting above the water protected, but the building allows all the water and the hydrology to move any way it wants to just as it did before the building arrived on site. 
And here, here's a picture of one of the parking wheel stops. Again, it's probably a $300 wheel stop. So again, it, it, the, the concept is more important than the, uh, the deliverable because again, they, they were really rather expensive to do. But uh, you know, the idea is very important to, to uh, reinforce the idea of, of, of saving materials and, um, sorry, I was reading something here, and uh, showing sustainability. There's the last little shot of the building again, which very much fades into the into the uh, landscape. Uh, and as the trees around it grow taller, uh, it's going to get even more quiet. But again, it's so so critical to understand that this building is not is not the, the big impact or not the point of the project. The point of the project is is the wildlife and the and the and the nature preserve. And in fact, right now, uh, Audubon is looking at land across the highway because this this the site in this uh, precious 300 acres is so overrun right now because so many people are showing up that it often has to get shut down for weeks at a time to let the trails recover from the foot traffic. So uh, we were probably a little bit too successful in our, in our kind of goals here. The next project is, is quite different. It is an urban uh, edge building in the edge of downtown Dallas. And it is, it is a adaptive use of an old 1920s Packard showroom and uh, maintenance building that, that showed cars and service cars back in the 1920s. Um, of course, right now it's, it's around a lot of parking lots. The land uh, just to the south of, of the building here will, will definitely be re redeveloped with, as, with large housing blocks over parking with retail and so forth. And there you have the Dallas City Hall. So this is a rather nice neighborhood that, that's beginning to get reestablished. Um, the building itself is a very simple little two-story um, you know, 20,000 20, square foot building that we renovated. And there's a future site for a, a, a larger sanctuary when they have the time and money and, uh, and, and congregation to support it. They moved from a suburban location to the edge of downtown Dallas in one of the toughest areas in, in downtown, which uh, in fact, there's a pretty large contingency of homelessness that's right around this project. And I have to say that, that my client in this church they, they just really uh, embraced this neighborhood with open arms and, and they happily moved into this site and really wanted to do something that, that put themselves here and show that they cared about this part of Dallas. And the cool thing is that we had more building than we needed. So in lieu of just simply building out more space, we decided to remove occupiable space and make it exterior space because you know, we had no porches, we had no outdoor space besides the hot street and the parking lot. So the area, the yellow here indicates areas on the first level where we basically just removed uh, the exterior skin and made it, made it exterior space. And the second level, likewise, uh, a courtyard, an upstairs courtyard and an upstairs courtyard here. So these, this, this be kind, of, kind of became the primary move to, re to introduce nature and light and gathering space for the congregation, which, you know, obviously is very critical now. And in fact, this project just finished as COVID kicked in and they began occupying the building probably about three or four months ago. So uh, they're loving it, they're enjoying it. Uh, and and they, they're finding themselves utilizing the outdoor space to greet people and hang out and, and do stuff. Uh, the section kind of shows where we've kept the center area of the building condition and intact, but then this is exterior here facing downtown, the front door, and this is an exterior space facing the parking lot to the south. So coming down a little bit, I think this is a little bit more current. You can see the building. You see the, the bays that, that were, where we removed the, the brick skin uh, to open up the building, um, and this, this is the, the north side of the building facing downtown, and, and there you, uh, you see, you know, uh, the one bay we removed with this becomes an entry, entry courtyard to downtown. And right now there's a sliding chain link fence that seals it off for security when it's not being utilized and opens up and people simply walk into the space and greeted by this little uh, Japanese maple tree. And then you go into the building. Um, from the parking lot side, you've got two bays removed. We've got holes cut into the roofs with vines and we've got um, you know stairwell and you can see handrails upstairs. You also notice that we did not really paint the building. We pretty much left everything as it was. We talked the client into 
letting it be, be like this. And you can see an old ramp that was there, the way they, how they drove cars up to the second level to work on them. Half the columns of the building had been run into so many times, they, they lost a lot of concrete. We had to reinforce them and protect them because they were almost collapsing. Um, this is the west elevation where we had to add one element. This is an ele elevator for accessibility. So this one stuccoed element adjacent to all this, you know, untouched uh, brick that's been there for, you know, for a long, long time. There's one, the last window we, we kept um, on the second level, uh, the rest mm -hmm. of them are completely rotted out. So we had to replace them and put in unfortunately new uh, storefront glass, which was a bummer, but you know, this sort of thing happens. Um, and you can see the, uh, the south elevation, just the brick as it was. If we needed to fill the window in, we simply put whatever brick we had in it, and they painted a blue, a brown stripe and put the name of the building on there. Of course, a fire stair out the backside, and that's pretty much it. Um, going into the lobby, you can see the entry court from downtown. Uh, this is the lobby itself, which is stained concrete floors. Uh, you can see that the, the columns with the original paint piled up on it. Um, pretty much, we did some water blasting to bring, clean some of the paint off. Um, but a lot of natural light coming in from both uh, the north and the south, which is again critical. You know, light is is something that that feeds our our spirit, and it's something that any any architecture or any place has got to have. And it needs to have different kinds of light. It needs to have north soft light. It needs to have south light that has shadows. It needs to have harsh light, grazing light. These, these are things that really make us human. And to be away from this, such a thing is just, is, is in, inhuman. Um, get a little stairway coming up. You can see where we simply cut a hole in the floor and put the steel on there and walked away from it. The second floor lobby looking out toward downtown there's a large opening. Uh, there's that window, that, that one window frame we kept, and there's a hole we cut here and a hole we cut here. Um, you can see looking down, looking, looking back, this opening for light and looking down, there's the, the maple tree. It's just doing great. It's getting plenty of light and it's growing very healthy. It's, it's doing great. In fact, it's gonna be coming up to the hole probably in the next few months. So that's, that's rather, um, it's working, let's put it that way. Very simple handrails. Uh, Again, the budget was very tough. We spent a lot of our time getting the project in budget. And again, you're going to find yourselves doing this if you get into this business. Uh, it's just the way things are. Not many projects have uh, endless or even big budgets. And frankly, it's having to deal with the budget and, and take away anything you, you can't, you don't need to have. You cannot, you, cannot, you cannot afford to put something in that you don't have to have because there's no budget for it. So basically, you strip away everything except for what's needed. Um, and, you know, we've been doing this for 40 years and we, we know how to do it, but every time it's still a challenge. A little temporary sanctuary until they can build a new one. Uh, you can see the, the, the concrete structure. Uh, this was the Trazo floor from the, uh, from the original showroom in the 1920s. Uh, looking, you know, to the east, you can see glass and we actually have a tent on the first six feet because there's a lot of people that hang out in the sidewalk outside of the space. And sometimes they kind of slam into the glass during service on Sunday morning. The congregation's fine with that. Uh, they're very chilled out and they're happy to be in this neighborhood. It's really uh, rather kind of special. You know, just in this short year during COVID, the, the building has really been taken over by the vines, uh, you know, and, and the planting we've done. And it just feels so good to me to, to have this kind of this, this urban jungle you know uh, when we moved on site there, there wasn't even a, a weed growing out of a crack so to see this trumpet vine which is kind of it, it's out of control but it, it just really makes me feel wonderful and looking up these openings seeing vines moving up through there it's just very special uh, really nice moments boston ivy uh, coming in, coming out off the wall here a little existing glass brick that was probably put in in the 30s or 40s and again, more of this lovely trumpet vine, the banded power lines, which we just left there. Um, you know, this, this place feels like it's been there for right at 100 years. Uh, it has a new purpose and has, has a new sense of place. And it's very much engages and embraces its history, uh, kind of warts and all. And I, I love that stuff. And I, I again, cannot help but 
just kind of, kind of uh, congratulate my client, All Saints Church, on taking us on and really following through with their commitment to, to really um, to do something that, that they said they wanted to do. Then this last project is uh, kind of in the suburbs. So we've kind of gone from rural to the edge, edge of urban condition to a suburb uh, that actually is trying to introduce an urban condition and uh, this kind of funky office building and retail site uh, for our client, uh, which is Half Price Books. And they have been our client since the mid uh, 1990s. And they're basically uh, a bunch of hippies that um, do things, do go about doing things in a very interesting way. And we, we just really get along and they, they're pretty nutty people, but uh, I love them. In fact, so this is the, their headquarters building, which is an old sports town, uh, an old, it's, it's been, had about six lives. So this building has been repurposed and they've been in it now for, for over 20 years. Um, about eight years ago, we repurposed the 1920s warehouse. That was uh, the first lumber yard in this area for Carruth Lumber Yard into an REI. And in fact, the president of, of, of Half Price Books, Boots mm -hmm. Anderson, she literally chased these guys and said, I want you in our building because we like the way you think. And she chases clients and tenants that she feels uh, reinforces their attitude about sustainability. These guys sell used books and they have amazing reading programs and they give books away. Um, you know, they are a model of sustainability. And so, you know, uh, for, for us to try to save this building and reuse it obviously makes a lot of sense. Uh, you can see this is sitting here next to Central Expressway, Northwest Highway. That's, uh, that's Preston Center. Downtown Dallas is over to the left over here. Again, this is kind of in the middle of, of suburban Dallas and it's just nothing but cars. The site um, that we're working on is this, this building, this four-story office building here, which is on the smallest side. It's about 60 or 70,000 square feet and a 5,000 square foot uh, retail pad that's going to be a restaurant. Um, the building started construction uh, about, gosh, almost nine or 10 months before COVID hit. And when COVID kicked in, uh, we had to shut it down because half price had to save every penny it could for, for salaries, for payroll. So um, we shut the job down and, uh, and half price managed to pay all of its employees, not lay anyone off during that period of time. And uh, they, they stayed healthy. So we kicked the project back in last it's been, it'll be a year next month. Uh, it's been a very, very difficult reboot. Uh, a lot of challenges with subcontractors. I think we're on our fifth steel director right now. Um, so we'll, we'll, we're gonna get there, but it's, it's challenging. Um, what makes this building rather interesting and I think very relevant to this, to, for today's talk is, um, and this comes from our client. Boots, uh, she, that's her nickname, her name is Sharon. She kept talking about wanting to do a roof garden with trees and we would say boots we can't afford to put trees and a roof garden on the roof on this building because we'd have to add to an elevator stop stairways and support all this weight of, of the landscape up there and it's just not in the cards for the budget but she kept pushing us on this thing and kept repeating her re repeating herself we finally got the message and we realized that that we could do a building that basically is uh an area of enclosed, you know, purposeful space. In this case, three, uh, three levels of office or retail above first level retail, but put these stairways, one stair, a second stair, the elevators, uh, put it outside and make, make the lobby of this building an exterior lobby. Don't enclose it, don't air condition it and give us some outdoor space to hang out and mill around. Uh, that's what we did. So you know, again, Boots kept telling us she wanted to be able to be outside to have events and have people you know, hang out up there. Um, and of course, it was a smart move economically because we're not air conditioning all that space, but it really became a fun project to um, take this idea and uh, in fact, join the two sites where you, you, when you're in the second or third or fourth level, you're looking back to the south, to the restaurant roof and this outdoor garden that's really formed by this amazing live oak tree that, that we saved and we kept. But you can see this, the gray, or out, gray outside space, it wraps around the floor plate. Uh, looking at the fourth floor, 
this is the enclosed office space here, and this is a 10 foot wide walk around. So you may take an elevator the stair up to the fourth floor, and you may, you may walk around and find the front door to your person you're visiting your office outside around the corner, or you may enter in here and go internally. You may walk back around and go to the bathroom, go into a vestibule, or you may come up for a, an event and have a glass of wine and sit outside the whole time. There's places, there's benches right here. We, we're gonna plant some trees in the second floor into a, in a large planter well, but we see this outdoor space being used a lot. Um, this is a section through the building. You can see the stairwell, which is outside, the elevators beyond. There's the enclosed office space, enclosed retail. And here's the, the second level balcony. There, there's a tree growing out of the balcony. Out, out of the second floor. And here we are looking into this, uh, into the, into the beer garden of the restaurant garden of the restaurant with this large, beautiful tree. Uh, and, and even the way this roof is being designed for the restaurant, we, we thought about the view of it from the office building looking down. So we've got basically snow fencing up there uh, to block the air conditioning units and kind of give some interesting action going on on the roof of this restaurant. This is an outdoor, a dining space. In fact, there's there's been several restaurants that wanted to rent the space and, and offered to take it, but they wanted to enclose us out here. And we just told our client, nope, don't do that. And they listened to us and said, no, we're not gonna we're not gonna enclose that. We're not gonna increase the square footage. The important the outdoor space is important as a breathing space between the restaurant and the office building. So we we we're now working with someone that wants to keep this outdoor space the way it is, keep it intact and keep that that area, that that break area between the building and the restaurant. This, um, this building is very interesting. It's, it's basically, uh, you know, this concrete box, uh, stack plates that we bolted these stainless steel anchors on. And we basically bolted two by eight, two by eight, sometimes with steel in between uh, to them and built this, this kind of veil around the building. Uh, you can see that the, the the stacks of the floor plates and then these these sticks of wood going up and down literally it's guys up there with with with, with drills you know in, in a lift screwing this wood on uh to these two baits and you know, the wood is is um it hasn't been planed it hasn't been finished it's raw and it's got it's kind of fuzzy those stripes you see came from the banding uh when the process of acidification when they put it into a kiln and they vacuum out and, and inject basically uh, vinegar to, um, to take all the edible meat out of the wood itself. But, but the technology is guys that drills, we can take the stuff down, move it around. Um, this building may, may morph for the next 20 years into who knows what, it may end up being a ghetto with floor levels of stuff hanging on. That's fine, fine with me. Uh, this is the wood several years later, and you can see that, see some of the strap marks, and you see it's got a nice kind of rough texture to it. Um, we save money by buying this wood and not having it planed. You know, often when you buy wood, you've got to surface it on one, two, three, or four sides. And this wood is a full inch and an eighth thick by eight and, a, and an eighth long, wide. Uh, it would have been milled down to seven and a half by three quarters. We, we've got an extra three eighths thickness and an extra, you know, almost inch of, of size. And also it's kind of nice rough surface of the, of the sawmill in, in the uh, back in the forest. So, Again, this is focused on budget. Uh, to, to, to finish the wood would have cost more money than we could have afforded. And frankly, the gnarliness of this wood really lends itself to the building and the attitude and the approach we took uh, you know, to skinning and, and shading the building from the sun. So you've got this stack box uh, and you've got you know, four sides of an elevation. And the elevations certainly reflect the, the solar orientation of the building. This is the south wall, south elevation. And you can see there's reasonable you know, shading on this. And you can see you know, this time of day, very little sun is reaching the building beyond. Uh, although at the corner we break away, so we bring in a lot of light to where this tree is gonna get planted right here. The, sun, the, the west side turns the corner, you can see that is dense right there. And as you move around from the south to the east, uh, you can see the east, we have no horizontal slats at all. Well, we couldn't afford them. <laughs> the wood's pretty expensive. So we actually researched, uh, and you recall, you know, a few minutes ago, I talked about the sloped glass in the, in the dogwood center to keep birds from flying into the windows. Well, here, 
um, you know, we, um, the glazing on the, on the east and north is glass that has uh, white lines etched in it every four inches. The birds see those lines and will not fly into it because you can see the beautiful cloud right there. If the bird is sitting on this rail, it would want to fly into that window to get out. Well, we would probably kill it. So again, you know, the cost of this glass was less expensive than the wood slat screen. We wanted the wood screen, but this was the right move because this is what we could afford. So, you know, you let the budget drive you. You have to at times, and you've got to be flexible, open-minded because the, the job, the purpose here was not to kill birds and keep the project on budget. And also to explain that the building has four sides and four different responses to the climate. And again, trying to coexist with nature that's around us. Uh, this is the north elevation. You can see the same glazing is happening over here. Um, th this is one of the stair towers. It's finally getting clad uh, in expanded metal lath. Again, both stairways are exterior uh, to save money. This one goes to the roof for maintenance. And uh, it's, again, this is very cost effective, expanded metal lath welded to uh, simple metal angle frames and then uh, either zinc dipped or hot dip galvanized. Like all the metal on the job is, is galvanized. The idea is not to have to paint it. If we do paint it, we'll start painting with galvanized paint down the road. But of course, the idea is not to have any maintenance as well. And we also like the kind of the, the color uh, palette of the building. Turning the corner from the north to the west, you can see how dense the shading becomes on the west. The lowest element turns the corner because that is, that is a sign band where people put signage for the retail center. So the west has, without a doubt, the most shading. And you can see how dense it is. And you see very little sun getting in there. Uh, this increased vertical shading is at the, at the elevator lobbies where we have a more kind of unique situation. Again, the, the, the sun cuts back um, at the uh, corner to let in light for the plants that are gonna get planted right, the trees that are gonna get planted right there. This is the walkway in the west. Uh, there is a glass door front of the, of the office building and that's the, the west sun. Right now it's probably about, oh, probably 1.30, 2 o'clock. And the sun certainly is well protected. You know, come 5.36, you'll start getting some light filtered in. But by then, the offices are pretty much shut down. The northeast side, you can see uh, this is in the afternoon as well. No sun's reaching it. And by the time it, it turns a corner to the south, this thing's pretty much in shade. But the idea is you're walking around outside to get to your space and, you know, promoting people getting outside and getting some fresh air. Go to the, get in the, go, go to the bathroom, walk outside, you know, cold weather, warm weather, get some fresh air, move. Uh, you know, bidding, sitting in the office all day is not healthy, uh, at your computer especially. So, you know, promoting people moving around. Here we are at the stairwell looking back, you know, to the southwest, and that's the planter that are going to receive about five uh, river birch trees, and that's, that's a bench right there. And you can see fire protection sprinklers, heaters, uh, lights. Uh, this is a functioning lobby for year-round. Uh, use. There's the elevator doors on the outside. There's the office right there. Again, exterior sprinklers. That's the uh, walkway on the west side. Uh, and there's the entrance to the bathrooms, vestibule. Looking back to the corner, there's uh, the west, that's the south. You see the sun filtering in here, but it really doesn't quite reach the wall, does it? And a really fun corner. Um, interesting view. So, you know, we, uh, when you do a project like this, and this is, was not a very big project, I would say it's about $10 million. You know, we, we had to engage a concrete subcontractor to do the concrete frame. And it's hard to find a small concrete subcontractor that does this sort of thing. So we had to go with a big guy. And they, they, they are so busy and so big that they really didn't want to talk to us. They say, we're just going to do it. You know, and you get what you get. We asked, what kind of forms do we get? Well, you're going to get caliber uh, grade D forms. Grade D means it's probably 30, 40 years old of, of sheet metal. Uh, it's going to be beat up. It's going to have lots of challenges and problems. Um, you look at some of these pans and they're just beat to heck. But, you know, that, that's what the budget could afford. So, you know, we, we had to embrace this approach and accept that as kind of enough, a rough aesthetic. 
it certainly ties nicely into the wood and that kind of approach there. But again, you don't get to choose what you get to use a lot of the time. Economics drive a lot of what we do. We're, we're a small firm. We don't have large budget projects. Uh, this client is unique in that they do invest in their buildings and they probably invest a little bit more than the speculative clients because they're not going to sell this. They're going to keep it and because this will become an income stream for them, you know, 20, 30 years from now. But still, it's a very challenging project and budget wise. And you've got to be fluid. You've got to be open minded and you can't be a big baby about what you're going to get or not get. You just got to go with the flow and, and, and accept it and be comfortable with that. And, and you better be good at it. Um, it's, it's just, you know, it's the way things are. And in, in fact, it, it really informs us on how we do our work. With, without this kind of, uh, with, without these parameters and these challenges, I, I think we would, we would, have, work, would have to work hard, very hard to, to come to what we're trying to get done. And, um, you know, it is, it, is, it is hard work. Here's a restaurant, uh, finally steals up and under construction. And uh, this will be covered in similar wood slats. Uh, it'll be, you know, uh, nice big open porch out toward the, uh, the outdoor area. Uh, this was us a few weeks ago on the job site. Uh, this is our superintendent, Glenn, on the uh, office building project. And these are three guys in my office. This is Tom Doherty, a principal. And Tom uh, was very much involved. And, and we need to thank him for his effort um, on the first project you saw, the Dogwood Canyon uh, Audubon Center. Tom is our lead guy and, and the principal in charge of, of managing most projects in the office. And he uh, got that little wood building through Leeds and he really persevered, a very challenging contractor and a challenging committee to make that happen. Uh, Eric, awesome young guy who uh, was responsible for the second building you saw, the All Saints Church. And it was Eric who really uh, came up with this great idea of, of carving the building away and repurposing the building frame for exterior space and outdoor porches. And Michael uh, is the guy that did the project you're looking at right now, Shady Brook. And it was Michael who, who pressed the idea of um, bringing the, uh, the circulation elements outside to save money, to reduce square footage of conditioned space, which also helped us tremendously on parking counts. You know, this side is driven by parking. Um, the building is, is shoved right against the parking, parking lot, um, but it kind of works with the ur urbanity of it and the density of it. But without these three guys, I would not be here with you today. Um, so, you know, my teammates, uh, my collaborators, uh, not to mention people like Glenn, the contractors, the consultants, these people are all so critical to the, to the success of any of these projects. And they, they, just, they just make this stuff happen. And um, without them, you know, it's just not gonna happen. Uh, last little tidbit, which uh, to me is the one element that really informed this project. And that is this live oak tree right here. And if you look at this tree, you realize it's growing at like a severe angle. Uh, because uh, until about, you know, two and, a, two and a half years ago, there was a building right against that tree um, it was a little retail strip center built in the 70s. And when we tore that building down, this built this tree was growing out of the grade beam. And we, we wanted to save the tree and we, we gave it a shot. In fact, the grade beam that 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 is uh, was plopped sitting next is still there. We, if we picked it up, we felt the tree would have fallen over. So we, we, we installed this strut here, which is very interesting in itself because the strut Right now, the tree is resting on a big rubber pad inside that kind of arc steel plate. After a good rain, um, four or five days after the rain, the tree will actually lift up and pull away and will not be touching that plate because trees move. It literally just lifts itself up in the air and is no longer resting on it. And then as water reserves go down, the tree is going to kind of fall back down and land itself on that rubber pad. So, you know, uh, the complexity of nature, the things we, we work hard to preserve, and this tree is going to make it. It's very healthy. We know our, know our landscape stuff. We work with great landscape architects. But it's, if this one small thing had not been there, this project would not have been 
the same for me. In fact, it would have been probably a failure. If you look, think about the impact of this massive green ball between these two, between these two buildings, it's everything. It, it, it's the breathing space, it's the focal point. And, you know, in our client, you know, the, the, the developer who was gonna help the client at one time, so we need, need to cut that down. It's just in a way. We said, we told our client to fire that guy, they fired him. Uh, but, but our client understood that and respected that. And we spent money to save this tree. But man, without that, again, without this, it would not have been worth the effort. And we would not have a project that I'm proud of at this moment. And I can't wait to see it finished, frankly. Um, the last comment I have, uh, and this is a practice we've been doing for a couple of years in our building is a lot of people bring dogs to work. And, you know, we're, again, a small building of about 12,000 feet. And there's maybe 30 people in there. But uh, we often have five or six dogs in the building a day. And it's amazing how the attitude and the environment changes because of the presence of the dogs. Not only do you have to be polite to dogs, you can't walk past a dog quicker. They'll bark and freak out. But it caused, it caused us to also show more respect to each other and be more respectful of the humans in the building. But, you know, these, these again, these, these ideas of reflecting back to nature, being, you know, taking a break and taking your dog for a walk, uh, you know, uh, take 10 minutes instead of a smoke break, walk your dog. You know, we are thinking about stuff like this all the time, trying to introduce ideas and elements into the workplace, into whatever place we're trying to develop that make it more human. And, and for me, humanity, you're not human unless you're really engaging in nature, all the aspects of nature, be it wildlife, light, greens, green trees, uh, culture, all these things. And it, it is a, one messy, beautiful pile of, of interaction. So I'm gonna leave that with you and hopefully we have some conversation or some, some questions here. Everybody hear me? Okay, how about now? Can everybody hear me? No. Okay, so thank you, Gary, for sharing all of your work with us. Um, my name is Chrissy Wire, and I'm going to kick off kind of our question and answer session um, while I wait for some more questions to come in. But um, with this theme of reconnecting, I noticed in all of the projects that Gary was showing us that he had this theme of reconnecting with nature. And then at the end, he talks about reconnecting back to um, people and humans. And so I, my question for you, Gary, is um, how did your office environment respond positively, I hope, or negatively um, to the pandemic. And then now that everything's opening back up, how are you finding the office environment is reconnecting? Thank you for your question. Um, like, like a lot of people, we, we certainly struggled through the initial months of the pandemic. And like I said, I was making uh, gallons of uh, hand sanitizer and, and tracking down masks. But, um, you know, our little offices were only six people. Uh, we have a landscape firm in the building with about a dozen people. We have some other architects in the building. We have some rendering people. And, you know, uh, we didn't get back to full-time occupation of the building in, until I would say about you know, maybe uh, three or four months ago. And, and we certainly, uh, everyone in my office is vaccinated. The majority of the building is vaccinated. And, and everyone has been extremely cooperative and understanding. And we certainly had to go through some learning curves to let people work from home. Because, you know, when you're working on computers and, and drafting programs, you are moving massive files. And uh, we, had to, we had to bring in fiber to get more connectivity for remote desktop work. And we, we still struggle a little bit with connectivity, but it's, it's, it's been uh, a nice challenge. But everyone in the building has been fantastic about it. And another question here from, from, uh, asked about how our clients have been responding to this as well you know, uh, meeting a lot of Zoom meetings with, with clients and, you know, I'm still, like we learned this morning, it's still hard to connect and, and, and technology in our infrastructure is pretty challenged right now. There's times when we may just lose complete uh, connectivity with the screen or whatever. People have stayed relaxed. Uh, our clients learned 
to uh, work on Zoom meetings. And we, we might have a meeting with 20, 30 people from a church. And you may have that many people online at the same time. And the first few meetings are pretty challenging, but people learn to mute their microphones and listen. And, you know, you kind of learn the right pace. But, you know, frankly, uh, I think that this whole virtual Zoom approach, we're, we're going to see, I think, a hybrid use of this over the years. Other people that are elderly that can't go to church uh, or, or synagogue or temple, whatever. And so you're, you're going to be doing, I think, uh, this sort of thing along with live meetings, just like y'all are now. Um, and we need to get tuned up on our technology and our infrastructure so we can do this because it includes it, it's more inclusive of people. So that's just so, so critical. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a question, a few questions coming in. So I'll start. Um, one of them states, thank you for sharing your wonderful work. I appreciate your attention to site from the oak tree to the watershed. Curious to hear how your conversation relative to this feature of architecture has evolved with clients over the last couple of decades as our understanding of complex ecologies increase. It's a good question because, you know, um, 25, 30, 40 years ago, the idea of landscape architecture in Texas was kind of really not heard of. Uh, I was lucky to work for a large firm in the uh, in the 70s that I, I learned to work with landscape architects and enjoyed their collaboration. But you know, today uh, clients are more tuned in. Our clients certainly are. They wouldn't be calling us unless they were were not. But um, they get it. Uh, and of course, you still spend a good bit of time explaining things to your clients and explaining the balance uh, of putting together a project. You know, again, you don't go into this thing going, I, I get whatever I want on my building. You've got to balance economics. You have to balance schedule. You have to balance the needs of the client. Uh, it's just all very challenging. But we, we find our clients become more uh, tuned in and more intelligent every day. Of course, with, with the availability of the internet and people look up things, uh, they, they've got resources. And, and we find that to be just uh, makes, makes them better clients. So uh, we're, I'm very excited about the future of, of working with clients and our clients in particular. And um, it's just, um, it just gets better. Okay, um, this next question sort of ties right in with that. It asks, what has been your biggest struggle with building while respecting the environment around? Um, I would say, uh, I'm not sure what the biggest struggle is. Obviously, like in the Dogwood Canyon Audubon Center, in that case, you know, we had to be very careful with the fragile landscape or the fragile hydrology of the site. So we had to, we had to respect the ground plane. And in that case, that was certainly very difficult and uh, sensitivity issue because that, that foundation was not inexpensive. And each project is gonna have its own set of challenges in terms of how to respect uh, the site and 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 the uh, and the land, and you know identifying that, identifying those elements, and then develop a path to get there and not fail. For example, you know you can have a great plan uh, to save trees, but if you don't put up tree protection fences and threaten people not to get near those trees, then you're not going to have the trees when the project's over. And to be frank, something as simple as a guy in a pickup truck parking under the tree to eat his lunch. Uh, you think about that over a year, that, that truck is going to compress the soil, it's going it's to push the oxygen out of the soil and crush the fine fibrous roots of the tree. Now, we, we think that trees have tap roots that get water. Most 99% of the trees out there get their, get their water and their, and their uh, nutrients in the first 10 inches of soil. And those, and, and those roots of those, of, those, of those trees are fine fibrous roots like capillaries in your in your circulation system so uh, driving over that can, can literally crush them and push the without the oxygen that the, the cannot do photosynthesis so you know you've got to understand the systems of the elements you're trying to save it and, and protect and then go about protecting them and and you just don't assume that people get it um i've i've seen projects where you've saved all these trees and then you know, the last month, the landscape, the landscape contractor comes in and starts trenching irrigation lines into the tree. Well, that trench, which is about a foot deep, 
through the roots of the tree, just kill half the tree because it's literally severed the roots off and water can, can no longer go from the roots to the trunk. So you've got, you've got to understand what you're protecting and how fragile it is. And you've got to be careful every step of the way. Uh, we, we did a little school that we actually picked up and moved a live oak tree, much like the one you saw in the last project here um, for a little school called Da Vinci. And we spent about $20,000 moving that tree of uh, a very tough budget. And we, we got it moved and we put a sprinkler system inside the tree and, and the tree did great. Well, the last, you know, four weeks of the project, they're grading the landscape to plant the grass. A bulldozer drives by and grabs the tree and drags it about three inches. And, and we thought we'd killed it, <laughs> uh, that same tree. So, you know, again, um, you almost have to be out there every minute of the, way of, the, of the day watching what's going on. And again, you know, you can't assume someone's going to be watching it. And if something happens that's terrible, you know, you can say it's not my fault. But, but if your project is, is, is compromised or your client's vision is compromised, then we've all failed. Um, so it's up to all of us to, to really fight to make sure that the vision we all develop over our initial you know, period of time with our clients is protected and, and made sure it's, it's maintained. And, you know, in all, and the vision always goes back to very simple, strong ideas. There's no fussiness about that. It's, you know, very straightforward. So it's, um, it's a lot of work and, and you just don't take it for granted and you, and you don't assume it's gonna be okay. Um, so our next question um, asks, what event or experience has caused you to have a sensitivity to actively address details that will help further your design language and overall clarity to your design moves on a given project? Another really good question. Um, so, you know, this, this approach to our work has, has take, took a while to get there. Again, we, we've office turned 40 years old uh, on the 1st of September. But um, this, the whole thing about getting projects built on schedule, in budget, um, is very real. And, and we've done a lot of, most majority of our work over the years has been very challenging projects in terms of budget. And, you know, I learned early on that there's not money left over to decorate the building. Uh, you know, you basically have got to strip everything away in order to get the thing in budget. And if it's not necessary, you know, to the structure or to the operating operation of the building or whatever, then you really can't justify it. And furthermore, any move you make as a design move needs to have multiple um, reasons and multiple benefits. Um, you know, be it shading a building in the, in the, in, from the sun or the wind. But it's really was it's, it's been dri budget driven all these years. Again, we cannot afford to do pretty things or things that that were, were added on. Um, again, it's just, the budget is so challenging. And over the years, this has really taught us to, to pursue the idea of stripping away everything that is not essential to the building or to the purpose. So, you know, you're not gonna see us promoting, you know, beautiful materials or, you know, this or that. We will spend money on, on craftsmanship because I like the human hand involved in a building. And, you know, the materials are going to be humble, but they're going to be appropriate. And they're also going to be sustainable and they're going to last. Uh, so, you know, it hits all the things that you have to do in order to make a budget happen. That is really driven over the years become our design philosophy. Um, and, and it's and frankly, if I didn't have the, this challenging budgets over the years, I'm not sure that I would have uh, developed that that approach. So I'm, I'm lucky that I had such tough clients and such tough budgets. So it's interesting that you mentioned um, having these tough budgets. What has your experience been in the last year with the volatility in building costs um, being all over the place? Has that made your job harder or have you already been accustomed to it because of having tough budgets to begin with? Um, excellent question. You know, last year, as you probably know, has been crazy. And we are daily, we are fighting uh, price increases, lead times. Like I said, on, on our office building in the last project, we're on our, we're on our I think our fourth or fifth steel erector because they keep walking off the job. That building should have been finished six months ago. It's just not because it's just, it's hard to get people on the job site. Um, 
gosh, the, the, the pricing is, is killing you at times. And, you know, you, you got to roll your sleeves up and drill down and go back and come up with new ideas, basically, because they're not going to give you more money. If they don't have it, they don't have it. So uh, everyone has got to, you know, acknowledge that it's challenging, uh, not just the budget, but also we're going to we're going to see subcontractors start to go belly up. Uh, we see you see challenges with craftsmanship because uh, the, the subs are getting too busy and they're having challenges managing jobs. In fact, a lot of MEP subs, subcontractors are going out of business. It, it's just, you know, it's all hands on deck. Uh, but you've got to do it with positive attitude, because uh, if you don't, you're not going to get it done. So it's it's um, a little bit more challenging than we're used to. But but, you know, again, uh, this is probably the fourth or fifth budget recession we've gone through because this definitely has been a recession the last one 2008 i'm still recovering from frankly uh that 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 almost killed us uh you know i went to three or four before that which were uh, awake uh, which were walk in the park compared to 2008 so i figured if i got through that we can pretty much do anything okay so do you find that you need to quote unquote sell sustainability to your clients uh, sometimes you do, uh, you know, and again, we, we're lucky we have clients that call us for a reason. Um, although, you know, it's you, you, you're not going to be able to justify a gold or a platinum lead building to a client and say it's going to cost you 25 percent more unless the client goes, I, I got this money. I want to spend it. Well, you know, we don't see that happening with our deal. So, you know, selling sustainability, you know, if I can make something sustainable and I can save my client operating costs over the next, you know, 20, 50 years, you know, in terms of air conditioning, in terms of maintenance or paint, uh, in terms of stuff falling apart, then we're going to do that. And again, it's back to this whole thing about balance. You know, you've got to justify your moves, you know, and making something sustainable is going to cost money. It's going to take money from somewhere else. You've got to find a way to balance that out and, and keep the overall thing in play. And frankly, the, the idea of the sustainability needs, needs to play into the narrative. So, um, we're lucky that our clients get this. Now, I know lots of, I have lots of architects, friends that are not as lucky as us in terms of working with clients that don't really care or may not care about such a thing. And, you know, that, that's, you do the best you can. Um, you, you know, you don't throw a ten, temper tantrum. You just, you've got to do your best to, to, to get them to understand the importance of sustainability and also the, the, the payback to them. And, you know, and you've also got to be honest. We don't, we don't hide budget things, we, we tell the truth. And if we want to do something that we feel is important, but it's expensive and it may not have uh, a lot of kind of um, purpose besides, you know, something that's kind of interesting, we'll tell the client that that this is really not that justifiable, but we think it's important culturally or whatever. And they usually go, okay, we accept that and we will spend that money. But again, being honest and, and tell your client what things cost and, you know, be honest about what you can afford, what you can't, and then, you know, try to get them to accept what your in, in package is. But it, it, it is it is a lot of back and forth, a lot of conversation. And, and of course, educating your client is everything. Um, and, you know, again, our clients tend to want to be responsible, but that's not always the case. And, you know, and not all my clients have been responsible clients over the years. We, we, we're kind of required to be responsible. We just kind of take an oath in terms of life safety and responsibility to our industry or our uh, institution. And, and, you know, we take that rather seriously. So we've had a few more questions and they actually relate to each other here. Um, but one of them is what should students learn and what skills do you look for in prospective employees? Um, It's funny, uh, you know, we're again, an office of six people and we hire people, um, you know, every couple of years, we, we don't have many people who want to leave and we don't pay that well either. People just like working here. We're very much a family and uh, we just kind of work on things till we get it right. And, you know, we, we get a salary, we just, we work however long it takes. But, you know, interviewing students um, certainly like to look at, at portfolios and look at skills but you know the thing that usually uh, grabs my attention is is attitude. Um, people that walk in the office and and they want a job, they want to learn. They're, they're not afraid to try anything. Um, to me, it's that 
you know, can do and I'll try anything kind of thing uh, that really gets my attention uh, to want to talk to a uh, potential employee more than ever. Um, because, you know, it's attitude and, and your persona that matters and, you know, and how you get along with people. You know, we've got a full blown wood metal shop here. Uh, I don't like people sitting on the computer all day. Uh, everyone goes to job site meetings. We go to the client meetings. Uh, it, it is, a, it is, a, it's a, an office of collaborative office of people. And we are very careful to respect everyone not to get stuck at the computer all day, you know, to go in the shop. If you don't know how to work in the shop, learn how to work in the shop, make a model, test it out. You know, we do renderings, but I'd rather show a client a cardboard model or a wood model than I would a rendering because you can fool people with renderings. But a model, people pick up, they look at it, they, they take it apart, you mess with it, it's, you study it, you tear it up. That, that is engaging. Looking at a 3D picture um, can be seductive, it can be deceptive. And, you know, again, I, I'd rather talk about the environment through almost a narrative and look at models versus showing beautiful renderings. Um, so, you know, this, this idea of what kind of people we're looking for, you know, it's, everyone's gonna come out of school with, with pretty good skills. And certainly working here, you're gonna to have to have model skills and computer skills, but it's your attitude that's going to make you wanna be part of this office and, and make us wanna invite you to come in to be part of our office. Wow, that's really important for all the students in the audience to know. Um, our last question in the question and answer chat is, how would you best incorporate nature in sites where the environment isn't necessarily a predominant feature? So the second project y'all saw, which was that church on the edge of downtown Dallas, that, in, that environment had no nature at all. It was, it was parking lot, you know, and roads and streets on all four sides. And, um, you know, and we carved, we cut some holes in the pavement, planted some trees, planted some vines. You can make nature happen. Um, you know, it's just, you just do it. And you, you, give, you, you give nature tools it needs, which, you know, but usually is, is light, water, dirt, <laughs> and some space. Um, don't crowd it. Uh, sometimes you can crowd it if it's the right certain kind of plant. But, you know, you find ways to, to bring nature in. And I consider also light you know, rain, wind, uh, you know, dust, these things are all nature. And, you know, you, it's important to experience such things. You know, again, like, you know, this, the last project, getting outside and walking, you know, for five minutes to go to the bathroom. You know, we, we did five years of work for a Native American tribe in Colorado in the Four Corners in Ignacio. And we did a school uh, for uh, three-year-olds uh, up through kindergarten, it was at Montessori school. We got to design, we got to decide what kind of school is best suited for this, for this tribe. And uh, in, in working with the tribe for several years, you know, I learned that, that um, the tribe had a reputation with the local school district that, that a lot of teachers in the school district thought that the Native American kids weren't very bright because they're, they're always quiet. They wouldn't answer questions and they wouldn't talk. Well, you know, um, I come to find out just spending, you know, a couple of years with my clients that with the tribe, um, young people are taught to hang back. And it's the elders that, that are allowed to speak for the tribe um, because you respect your elders. And in, in a Native American tribe, that's even more important. Uh, but these kids did not raise their hand and did not engaged because they, they felt they were being rude if they did such a thing. So, you know, uh, another, another, another aspect that I learned, you know, there's a lot of deaths uh, during the holidays, Christmas holidays with young people or adults in the, in the tribe. They, they may have a car accident. They may uh, have suicidal tendencies. And, you know, there's a lot of different theories about all that, you know, but when you get down to basic uh, climate design, you know, when winter comes, there's less hours of sunlight in the day. And it's actually the amount of light that occurs in the fall that signals trees to start dropping leaves. It's not the temperature, it's the light. So, you know, I kind of was asking myself, well, you know, if the trees are not getting much light during the winter time, what about the humans? What about these kids in these classrooms? Uh, they're not getting as much sun. They're not getting as much fresh air. You know, 
maybe we, maybe we need to find a way to bring, bring nature into the classroom. So we, we decided that every classroom we, we design in this school is gonna have windows from two orientations and each classroom is gonna have a large porch. So we can encourage classes outside. Furthermore, believe it or not, this is in Ignacio, Colorado. When you get, it gets down, you know, five or 10 below in the wintertime, you have to walk about four minutes to get to the cafeteria for lunch. So midday, the kids are gonna get stand up, put their coats on, they're gonna walk you know, two by two, you know, down uh, the porch, if it could be a blizzard outside, and they're gonna go to the cafeteria in the cold weather. They're gonna go inside the cafeteria and take their coats off and sit down and eat, and they're gonna put it back on and go back to the classroom. But that action right there, you know, standing up and walking for those few minutes is going to get them fresh air, get them light and, and move, move their bodies. You know, and, and I was taught that by another client in the 90s. Um, we did a, a little school, French school called La Ligue Francaise, and it's a, a French uh, school that they pull all, all over the world. And that client asked to have all circulation hallways to be exterior. They, they want to know interior walkways. So one, one client teaches me something about getting out, taking a walk from the classroom to the gym or to the cafeteria. And then, you know, eight or 10 years later, you know, I, I find a situation where, you know, that trick there makes a lot of sense. Um, so, you know, just those simple things and, and breaking down the science, um, you can't assume anything when you're doing, when you're when, as an architect and people are not going to tell you these things. You've got to kind of figure it out for yourself and you've got to read in between the lines, look at the body language of your clients, listen to how they talk, listen to what they're saying. And you can begin to really break down and understand what's needed. And, and a lot of times what's needed goes beyond the physical aspect of a building. It goes, is, it goes to the program and how the buildings are used. And we engage with our clients and how the buildings and how the program is used. We've told clients they don't need a damn building. We, we, got, we, we got fired because we didn't want to do a building because we didn't think they needed a building. You know, if that's the case, that's the case. So, you know, it's um, don't take anything for granted and do your research. Well, unless there's any questions here in Lubbock, that is it for the chat. So Gary, thank you so very much for your presentation and taking the time to speak with us today. Uh, it was a very interesting presentation. So we appreciate your time. Well, thank you. And I'm so sorry I couldn't be there in person. I really was looking forward to this. And, and uh, I was very much bummed out this morning when I learned that the flight was canceled. So I look forward to coming up because uh, I always also want to kind of move through the studios and visit with some students. So we'll find a time to do that. Um, I love Lubbock, very important city, great music city, and uh, Texas Tech is an, an important school. And uh, I, you know, applaud all of you and the work you're doing up there. So thank you all so much for, for inviting me to come into your Zoom screen today. Certainly. Thank you. We look forward to hosting you in person soon. Take care. Thank you again.